good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm particularly excited about this discussion, both given uh, what's in the news uh, this week, next week, and also because uh, national security issues in conjunction with the changes uh, that are un uh, underway in the United Kingdom uh, aren't a frequent conversation, so I think this will be a rich conversation. I'm Fred Kemp. I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. And thank you uh, all for joining us today and for those that are also joining us uh, by, by live stream. Uh, with the, for a discussion with Sir Mark Sedwell, Cabinet Secretary of the United Kingdom. He also serves as the head of the Civil Service and National Security Advisor. Uh, Sir Mark, thank you for being with us. Um, he joins us at uh, a historic point for the United Kingdom's role uh, in the European Union, for sure, and the world perhaps as well as well as a pivotal time for the U.S.-U.K. special relationship and the larger transatlantic partnership. For almost six decades, the United Council has served as a forum to promote U.S. leadership and engagement in the world uh, through close collaboration and partnership with our friends and allies. But nowhere has this engagement been more impactful than it has uh, been with our European partners and particularly with the United Kingdom. Uh, over the last century, the special relationship uh, between the U.S. and the United Kingdom helped anchor and provide stability to the broader transatlantic alliance amidst two world wars and much uh, geopolitical turbulence. There are probably no two countries in the world have hit so much far further above their weight by coming together uh, in terms of shaping history. And I would argue that the cooperation remains as critically important as ever, trans transcending personalities and party politics while serving as a driver of peace, prosperity, and security for the UK, the US, and beyond. Um, regardless of which Brexit path the UK chooses, one thing remains clear. Our bilateral relationship has contributed much to the safety and stability of the Western Alliance and the wider global system, and surely will play a role in both governments' navigation uh, of the complex set of global challenges we face today. Precisely because of these challenges, Russia's aggression in the Ukraine, hybrid warfare elsewhere, China's outsized presence as a global tech superpower, a rapidly changing global economy, and just downgrade uh, this week uh, of European growth by the ECB and new stimulus measures, this relationship must continue to play an important role in the community. What's needed now is a forward-looking strategy, and that's what we work at at the Atlantic Council, uh, embedded in a broader Atlantic alliance to adapt this relationship to the very real set of complex 21st century challenges. Uh, with that said, uh, I look forward to hearing Sir Mark's take on all this, as well as his thoughts on the UK's global role uh, post-Brexit or irrespective of Brexit or however you want to talk about it. Uh, and how he sees this fitting into the broader transatlantic relationship. Um, as the Prime Minister's senior most policy advisor, Sir Mark acts as the Secretary to the Cabinet and is also the Prime Minister and Cabinet's principal advisor on national security strategy, policy, capability, and civil contingencies. In his role as head of the Civil Service, Sir Mark also leads nearly a half million public servants who work across the British government. He joined the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in 1989, serving in Egypt, Iraq, Cyprus, and Pakistan. Uh, he later served as the Permanent Secretary at the Home Office, Political Director uh, of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the NATO Senior Civilian Representative in Afghanistan, and Her Majesty's Ambassador to Afghanistan. Uh, there aren't a lot of easy jobs in there, Sir Mark. He has a Master's Degree in Economics from the University of Oxford, and a bachelor's degree in international economics from the University of St. Andrews. Uh, as you'll hear, his knowledge of British politics and foreign policy is second to none, and I'm sure he will offer a unique insight. Uh, Sir Mark, uh, the floor is yours. Wow, uh, that is quite an introduction. Thank you very, very much, and uh, I'm flattered uh, to be here, and it's good to be back at the Atlantic Council. I think, in fact, the last time I was here was when I was working uh, for NATO and talking about the comprehensive approach and uh, how we were dealing with Afghanistan uh, at that time. Uh, it's very good to be here in Washington. I'm just here for a very brief visit, so I'm glad we were able to find the time uh, to, do, uh, to do this session. I've been over at the White House this morning seeing the 
uh, um, National Security Advisor, but also the President's econo uh, Economic Advisor, Larry Kudlow. And part of the reason I'm here is, uh, as you've suggested, we're going through an absolutely crucial few, uh, few days uh, on Brexit, and I guess there might be some questions about that, most of which I will um, give you fairly bland answers to, as you will, uh, for reasons you will understand. Uh, but actually, we have to be looking beyond uh, that, and our relationship with the United States uh, is not only a, uh, a, 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 a crucial pillar of our national security, it's a crucial pillar of our, of our economic future. We've talked about a future free trade agreement, we've talked about a deep uh, uh, future economic partnership with the United States. Uh, we, uh, there are a million jobs in the United States that depend on uh, UK investments, a million jobs in the UK depend on US investment, and we want to seek to uh, build that relationship in the future. And the big task for us over the next 10 years in my country is to make a success of Brexit. And uh, as we reconfigure our economy and re uh, reorient ourselves for the global Britain era, uh, beyond that, then, then our relationship with the United States will be uh, 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 as central, if not more central, than it has been uh, in the past. What I wanted to do, though, was just talk uh, briefly about a few of the big trends, the big global trends that I think are going to affect the context within which uh, we are uh, operating. Um, uh, the shift of uh, global economic power from the Atlantic to the Pacific, the impact of the fourth industrial revolution coming together with uh, a very significant demographic change, particularly in uh, Western uh, societies, uh, and how some of the um, uh, familiar national security threats, which are the kind of things that in an environment like the Atlantic Council one might have spent uh, most of a conversation like this talking about how some of those have had a 21st century upgrade, but in, but in some ways are the, are the ones we understand best and we understand the implications of uh, best. I then thought I'd just talk a little about how we're organizing, uh, reorganizing the way we approach national security and some of our other governance challenges in the UK through the approach we've called the fusion doctrine. Uh, we like to think it's new, but I also have a copy of Sun Tzu's Art of War on my desk, uh, which reminds me that most of the concepts in there, uh, in our fusion doctrine, are actually thousands, uh, thousands of years uh, old. And we used some of those indeed in dealing with uh, the aftermath of the Salisbury uh, 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 incidents that, uh, that, uh, you, that you referred to. So let me touch on those things, and then we're going to take some uh, questions. So first, shift of global economic power from the Atlantic to the Pacific. This is a, this is a, this is a really profound change. If you, actually, if you look back over the past two centuries, the world's largest economies were in the North Atlantic, very largely, most of them anyway. Obviously the United States, but also some of those big European economies. By the middle part of this century, uh, the world's largest economies will be Pacific, including the United States, but of course, notably China, but also India, not quite Pacific, but certainly uh, 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 Asian, but also countries that we probably don't think of as, uh, or we don't see in the news quite so often, like Indonesia, you know, a huge country with a very, very fast uh, growing economy. And that is going to have a profound effect uh, on uh, the, the global uh, order in the 21st century. The future, uh, the core of it, is the relationship between Washington and Beijing, and that will determine essentially the course of the world economy, global security, and you could even argue the future of the planet, since issues like biodiversity, plastics in the ocean, climate change, will be very heavily determined by the attitudes of uh, the, two, uh, the two biggest powers. Uh, and one of the questions for countries like mine is how do we adapt? How do we influence? How do we, what role do we play um, uh, uh, as that uh, shift in uh, the global order plays out over the next few decades. Second, and even more profound, I think, is this, con this conjunction of the fourth industrial revolution with this huge uh, set of technologies all coming together at the same time, but also coming together with demographic uh, change and some of the political effects uh, of that. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution is probably going to have a more profound effect on economies and societies than any since the first. And it's, beca it's partly because of the pace at which it's happening. Um, it is, I should you know, say uh, uh, up front, a hugely positive factor. But if you look at the possibilities of uh, broadband, access to huge data, autonomous technology, AI, machine learning, quantum computing, etc., and bring all of the, and see all of those technologies coming together as they will in the next decade or so, it's going to have a very profound effect on our economies, our societies, and the way we uh, organize governments. And countries that adapt successfully to that will prosper, and those that don't will inevitably uh, fall behind. And let me just give you an example of, of, uh, uh, of the kind of social effect this could have. Think of uh, an elderly person who's infirm or someone who's disabled. Where, as these technologies come together, um, they will achieve the effect for everyone, not just for the wealthy, 
but for everyone, of having access to what in effect is the same as having a personal driver, a personal gardener, a personal housekeeper, personal healthcare uh, assistant, um, uh, and access to all of the data in the world. Technology, autonomous technology, all of these things is going to enable that to happen. That is going to have a profound effect on people's, uh, on people's uh, lives uh, of all kinds. And uh, as I said, it's a, very, it's a hugely positive factor if we can harness it, and the countries that harness it are the ones that are going to prosper. At the same time, we have demographic change. Um, uh, uh, societies in the northern part of the planet are aging mostly. Societies in the southern part of the planet um, uh, remain uh, very uh, young. And so uh, we're going to face, uh, over the next decade, increasing dependency ratios in the United States, in Western Europe. Uh, and so w some of the biggest challenges are not only ensuring that as people live longer, they, the, they live healthier for uh, a longer part uh, of their lives, but in doing so, remain economically active and ensure that uh, we can, we can uh, 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 address those dependency, uh, th that, that changing dependency ratio in a way that enables everyone to participate and make their contribution to the economies. And of course, there is a virtuous circle. People who are economically active tend to be, tend to be healthier too. But that is going to mean that we have to change the pattern of working lives. You know, my grandfather was a steel worker and worked in a chemical plant. Um, he worked uh, until the statutory retirement age, retired, stopped working, you know, no, no further work at all, um, uh, uh, had a fairly short old age and, and died a few years later. That is not going to be the pattern uh, 10, 20 years from now. People, people's working lives will be much more modular uh, than they were for the generation uh, before. And bring that together with the technologies and we're going to see profound uh, economic and social change. One of the biggest challenges we need to ensure that the people for whom the last great wave of globalization did not benefit, um, certainly uh, since the crash in 2008, that the benefits of that economic and social change extend to our entire uh, societies. We have to be confident in, our, uh, in the, the model that, uh, that uh, the Western Alliance uh, has promoted, democratic politics, uh, successful market economies and inclusive societies. It has succeeded in the past, it's been challenged in the past, but it succeeded in the past and it will succeed again because only that kind of model is the model in which uh, innovation, creativity and, and the flexibility of our, of our societies can really, uh, can really uh, prosper. Um, third, and I, I, uh, as essentially as a national, uh, uh, as a person who sort of grew, spent most of his, uh, of his working life in national security, uh, is the thing you might have expected me to uh, focus my remarks on. And that's essentially national security challenges and threats, uh, all of which are familiar, but which have had an upgrade in the 21st century. Uh, so those are the threats we've been preoccupied for most of the past two decades with terrorism, essentially emerging from failed states, but uh, now reaching through cyberspace straight into our own communities and radicalizing some of our most uh, vulnerable people. So people who've never been near any of the conflicts in which some of this, uh, this phenomena has originated uh, are being radicalized and radicalized at great pace uh, uh, by them. Uh, second, you have uh, fragile states and organized crime and corruption spilling out of those and uh, uh, into, uh, again, into Western societies, into our financial uh, markets and criminal groups um, able to establish networks, able to penetrate the institutions of the state, uh, create a protective environment uh, and therefore uh, operate with impunity. That threat, by the way, although it doesn't tend to catch the headlines, kills more people and costs more money than the other national security threats uh, combined. Um, uh, and, and those criminal networks are not it's not like Marlon Brando in The Godfather with a command and control and a very static uh, arrangement. You take out one of those organized criminal groups and another one fills the gap. They're highly networked, highly multilateral, and they evolve very quickly. Uh, and one of the challenges for law enforcement uh, is can we evolve at the pace uh, at which they do in order to continue to outmatch them. And third, we ha as we've seen in the past year, we're almost at the one year anniversary of the Salisbury attack, we see the activities of malign, uh, malign states. Uh, General Gerasimov, the Russian uh, defense chief, set out in a speech again recently a doctrine that uh, sometimes bears his name, which is essentially about full spectrum conflict, um, much of it operating below the level of formal armed conflict in the, uh, in the modern era. Uh, and we've seen elements of that, direct uh, attacks like the one uh, in Salisbury, um, uh, 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 um, uh, attempts to influence uh, elections, disinformation campaigns and so on, in small parts in most Western countries. But if you want to see where it uh, uh, happens, uh, uh, essentially the full fat version, 
go to Ukraine. Ukraine has faced uh, the full suite of that hybrid conflict from uh, uh, um, armed uh, militias, uh, weapon supplies, direct intervention, disinformation, cyber attacks, uh, corruption, uh, and so on. Uh, and that's the nature, that is the nature of modern conflict. And what we're going to have to do is develop our deterrence doctrines and our military and security doctrines in order to be able to deal uh, with that threat. Um, but all of those threats are ones that I'm confident we do have the ability to deal with. We will have to improve the agility uh, and the cohesion of our uh, security response, but we've shown that we know uh, how to do that when we can bring it together. The really big challenges, uh, uh, they're going to determine, as I said, the, the course of uh, the world economy, global security, uh, the uh, planetary sustainment are actually the first, uh, the first two, and it's those that all of us need to uh, uh, all of us need to give our attention to, whether in government or in uh, organisations like this. A uh, couple of words about the UK. Uh, we believe that we are uh, in good shape to deal with this. We have a uniquely, uh, uniquely balanced set of national uh, capabilities, and I'm just, you know, this is the advert break, so uh, uh, hopefully my British colleagues will applaud at this point, or at least smile, uh, and others will you know, probably wonder what I'm uh, talking about, so regard this as the advert break, but the UK, take national security, is the only country, we think actually possibly the only in the world, but certainly the only in the G7, Europe, NATO, that meets both the 2% target for defence and the 0.7% target of national income for uh, development. We've got a global diplomatic network, seat on the Security Council, world-class security intelligence agencies and law enforcement. Scotland Yard, the world's most famous law enforcement brand, and brings with it uh, behind it uh, a great deal uh, of substance. But we've also got in the City of London, one of the world's great financial hubs, a uh, highly flexible labour market, natural geography connections to the world, the, the, uh, the most globalised economy in the G20. And so for a country like ours, in order to be able to have the effect that we want to have, the global influence we want to have in our national interest, through uh, a programme or a strategy we're, we've, uh, we've, we've described as Global uh, Britain, um, the challenge has been to bring all of those capabilities, national, not just national security or governmental capabilities together, in a coherent way in order to support our national security, our national economic and our global, uh, our global influence. And we've called that, uh, that approach fusion, uh, but essentially it, it's, uh, uh, it, at its heart is a, it's about bringing all of those capabilities together in, uh, in support uh, of that and enabling us therefore to have a greater impact than we would if we uh, operated uh, any of those um, separately, as is the traditional, as is the traditional way. Um, that kind of approach needs to is the is is as I said, it's it's one of the oldest um, uh, philosophies uh, around about uh, about governance. We've seen it operate successfully in counterinsurgency with a comprehensive approach. We need uh, to bring a, a full spectrum approach together to for modern deterrence. But it's also how we promote our economies and our economic interests. Uh, in the global era because if I look at the UK for example we have been uh, securing agreements with several countries to maintain continuity uh, of trade and economic partnership as we leave the European Union well guess what the countries with whom that has been uh, the most uh, straightforward conversation are the countries with which we have the deepest relationships that go beyond the economic uh, relationship you know that's perfectly natural it's the way anybody does business it's the way countries do business uh, as well it's also the approach, in my view, that we have to take as the Western Alliance uh, as we face these global uh, issues together. And that's one of the big challenges I think, uh, I think we face. Um, we've, we have been so used to, at least since the end of the Cold War, um, that our values, our approach uh, are prevailing. Some of those are being challenged, as they haven't been at least since uh, the Cold War. Uh, and uh, in a sense, the clue's in the phrase. We will uh, face those most successfully if we face them together, and uh, in facing them together, we will always need to face them with the US playing uh, the central role. And so with that, um, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you for having me. Thank you, <coughs> thank you so much, Sir Mark, for that um, incredible tour across a set of global issues. And I, uh, I appreciate in the time when so many people are focused on the, the news headlines around Brexit that you take a moment to step back and talk about the strategy going forward. Um, just to say here at the Atlantic Council, I see some of the members of our team who have been working on this. We've been trying to underscore how to think through beyond Brexit the architecture for the US-UK going forward. So I want to I play that out in our conversation. 
Uh, but first, uh, let me take this off the table because everybody is wondering. Um, and I do want to encourage those who are following the conversation, particularly online, using the hashtag StrongerWithAllies to, to join us. Um, but tell us a little bit about what to expect next week. The Prime Minister, Prime Minister May, gave some remarks today uh, in Britain, um, cautioning a message both to the Parliament as well as to the European Union, telling the Parliament that Britain may never leave the European Union if they vote no next Tuesday. Um, and delivering a pretty strong message to the EU to give it one more push, um, warning of a, of a moment of crisis. So help us understand what's going to happen next week and what this means. Well, I think what the Prime Minister was setting out was we are, we are uh, really at the decisive moment. Uh, and uh, that's what she was talking about this morning. But she has uh, set, uh, this is very much a, an argument that she has uh, set out before. Uh, that uh, after a, a long and very detailed negotiation, we have achieved uh, a deal with the EU on how we will withdraw and then set out a, um, uh, in a political declaration uh, the parameters of the future partnership that we want to establish once we have become, once we've left the EU and uh, are, are operating uh, outside. Uh, and uh, she has been clear, and she said this many times in Parliament, as have other members of her government, that essentially the choice boils down now to that deal, or leaving without a deal, or potentially not leaving at all. And I think that's what she was uh, um, uh, trying to concentrate minds on in what she was saying this morning. And we're, over the next few days, uh, we're seeking to um, finalise that, uh, that agreement, uh, and then of course uh, put it to our Parliament next week, uh, uh, and uh, hope to see, secure their approval. So I know Tuesday is the day you want to get an approval, but what does happen if the deal is voted down again in the Parliament? Well, um, again, we've set out, I mean, some of this is around quite, quite uh, detailed parliamentary procedures, which the government set out a couple of weeks ago. But uh, uh, essentially, Parliament will vote, on, as you say, on Tuesday. Uh, and then depending on how that goes, there, might be f there will be further votes if, if, that, if the uh, vote is, is um, in favour of the deal. Then we move on to introducing uh, what's called the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. That's the legislation that enables us to ratify it, and then that goes through. That's quite a detailed piece of legislation. If Parliament votes against the deal, then there'll be some further motions the following day on whether we, are, we still intend to leave without a deal on the 29th of March or whether we should seek an extension. Obviously, uh, uh, we'll see how those votes turn out, if that in, indeed is the case. So let me turn back to the theme that you, you sort of laid out a vision for uh, the era, Global Britain era. Um, and I think many of uh, the champions of the U.S.-U.K. relationship have been worried that Brexit was an enormous political distraction for the, the U.K., um, concerned about the political will, the resources, the capabilities, but also the political capital and investing in the vision that you just laid out. Obviously, Brexit has been consuming politically in, in your country. Um, how can you assure those that have been concerned that, that Brexit has triggered an inward-looking U.K., that the vision you've laid out of Global Britain is, is, is a viable one, that there will be the political will, the resources and capability, and the, the investment of political capital. Well, I think if you look at our history, um, that's very much the approach we've taken. As I said in my remarks, the UK is the most globalized economy uh, in, the, uh, in the G20. And for us, Global Britain is a very um, uh, hard-edged uh, uh, approach in our national interest. Um, we, our, our economy is one of the, as I said, our economy is one of the most open in the world. Uh, we're a strong supporter of the uh, global free trading uh, system and because that's always been in our national economic interest. And if you look at um, all of those who've campaigned on whatever side of the argument about uh, Brexit itself, um, they have campaigned um, uh, for the UK to be an open and, and globally focused uh, economy, but also, uh, but also country. So there's a strong consensus that that's the direction the country should go in, and it's because uh, that suits both our traditions, but we also believe it's in our economic, social, and uh, interest for the future. So if you could give us a feel as well of what your agenda is with the United States. You're here in Washington, you met Ambassador uh, Bolton, uh, Larry Kudlow, you're, you'll be seeing uh, Secretary Pompeo. Um, how, you know, the, how do you, we've in fact sometimes argued here with our colleagues at the administration to think about a U.S. strategy that engages on big, big issues, London with the European Union going forward, so that we have a means of sort of keeping the transatlantic relationship focused on these biggest issues. 
How are you mapping out what comes next with your counterparts here in the administration? Well, inevitably, on a visit of this kind, there's just an awful lot of the immediate business right. to do. So we're facing uh, you know, a great many challenges that uh, inevitably dominate the conversation. So it was very interesting to hear uh, uh, from Ambassador Bolton about the Hanoi summit, for example. We talked about Syria. We talked about uh, uh, other um, uh, other immediate national security challenges that we're facing uh, together, and I guess I'll also concentrate on some of those uh, this afternoon. Um, uh, with uh, uh, Larry Kudlow, we were talking about the bilateral uh, uh, economic partnership and uh, uh, how we might develop that once we're um, uh, through Brexit and uh, able to pursue, uh, pursue the agenda that both our governments have set out in many <coughs> meetings uh, between the President and the uh, uh, and the Prime Minister over the past over the past couple of years. So the there's a mixture. FDA. Yeah, exactly. There's always there's always a mixture of the immediate mm -hmm. and uh, and the future facing. And of course, we're looking ahead to uh, uh, the president's uh, the, the president's next visit to the UK uh, and the agenda that we might uh, set for that. Mm -hmm. President Macron uh, this week put out uh, an op-ed in papers across Europe. Um, what was really written in response to the sh the shock of Brexit, if you will. Uh, and sort of two questions there. One, one was there were some concerns of would the EU face the issues of its own reform or would it you know, be diverted by the negotiations with Brexit to lose attention on some of the issues that made Britain's question their membership in the European Union? So I just wondered if you'd be willing to offer a little bit of reaction to how the EU is, is responding to Brexit uh, uh, with some of the ideas that Macron proposed, some of the reform, and specifically within that, he suggested this idea of a European Security Council that would include the UK to keep you yeah. anchored on key security decisions with Europe. So I, d I don't think one should see the agenda that he set out as entirely triggered by Brexit. I mean, he has, he has significant concerns about the structural challenges facing the EU uh, as a whole anyway. Uh, and we see many of those tensions playing out uh, anyway with, uh, between the various uh, continental countries uh, and so it, it would be a mistake for us to think that the U European agenda is all about Brexit it really isn't there are many many significant challenges that face our European partners within the EU 27 uh, many of which uh, President Macron is seeking to address in setting out uh, this agenda and those challenges are uh, economic social as well as uh, as well as security uh, and defense it's also worth just keeping in mind that, um, as many people have said, including those who campaigned very hard to leave the EU, we are leaving the EU, we're not leaving Europe. And uh, we will remain uh, the second uh, biggest contributor to NATO, uh, very actively engaged in European security uh, and uh, defence. We have a strong defence relationship actually with France through the Lancaster House uh, Treaty. And when President Macron was over in the UK last year, we refreshed that and set a forward agenda uh, at, the, uh, at the Sandhurst uh, Summit. And we have many other relationships that we will uh, double down on uh, 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 as we leave the institutions uh, of the EU. And of course, we're seeking, if you look at uh, the, the agenda we've set on security, we're seeking the closest possible cooperation with the EU and with the European countries uh, on national security issues uh, once we leave and are, and are operating uh, operating independently. The European Security Council idea is, uh, has, has uh, uh, come and gone from uh, time to time. I think it's a positive gesture, uh, but obviously we, you know, we'd want to look, uh, uh, look and, uh, and see in what context uh, that, might, uh, that might take place. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in your remarks uh, the, the reaction, the charge that Britain's, uh, that your country led after the Scruple attack. Uh, you mentioned the challenge that continues of Ukraine. One of, as we've talked to many of our colleagues in those regions, whether it's in Europe's East, the Eastern Partnership countries, the Western Balkans, is that the United Kingdom was a driving force in terms of EU policy in these two areas, where a lot of EU instruments have been sort of the major instruments with which to promote reform, with the prospect ultimately of these countries drawing closer to the European Union. How do you maintain your sort of pole position, if you will, in playing in the Western Balkans and Europe's East, uh, Ukraine, Georgia, these countries, outside of the European Union? Well, I think we should be very proud of what uh, we achieved in a leadership role within the EU during the period of our membership. Uh, and we've now chosen to leave, but that history is there and, and that track record is there. And you talk to, you, once you look past the immediate Brexit negotiations, which are obviously a preoccupation, and talk to European, our European partners about the issues that are facing the continent beyond that, uh, as you say, 
you know, still significant challenges in the Western Balkans. Uh, the external uh, threat from Russia, which we saw very vividly with Salisbury, but which other countries have seen uh, in, uh, in other ways. And think about how the EU, how NATO, how uh, national capabilities are brought together. There's a very strong appetite for the UK to maintain that leadership role that we've that we have always uh, we've always played. So the relationship will evolve, of course it will, because we will be outside the institutions of the EU, but we remain completely committed to the security of the continent. Mm -hmm. We'll work in the closest possible alliance with our partners in the EU and our allies uh, in NATO, and we'll find new ways of doing so. So from the EU bank to, to NATO, uh, London has offered to host the leaders meeting Indeed. at the end of the year in December. Um, obviously, this will return President Trump to, to London. We are on the verge of hosting all the foreign ministers here for the 70th anniversary ministerial, which Secretary Pompeo will help host. And there is an ongoing debate of whether the story along the alliance is one of success. It's getting fit for purpose with the challenge of the East, making progress on uh, burden sharing, um, or whether it still will fall below the benchmark of President Trump's uh, desires to see the allies investing in their own defense. And what will that look like? What will the president's reaction look like? How do you frame and think about the leaders' meeting in December? What are your objectives for that meeting? How are you helping to tee that up? Well, it's still some way off to be setting very specific objectives. And as you know, <coughs> with summit meetings, they're often dominated, whatever the long-term objectives, they're often dominated by whatever the events are uh, of the day. So you know, who knows exactly what, uh, in particular, security challenges sure. we might be facing by that. This time last year, we didn't think we would be all preoccupied with the immediate aftermath of a chemical weapons attack on the streets sure. of a quiet English uh, country town. So we just have to keep, you know, keep that in mind. But I think in terms of the broader question you ask, in a sense, the answer is a bit of both. Uh, the, uh, the effort to increase defense expenditure led by the United States, um, uh, and of course, which President Trump has taken a very vocal uh, position on, has actually achieved a great deal uh, so far. There are uh, uh, significant commitments coming through uh, in many countries. More countries are hitting the 2% uh, uh, target and, uh, and have plans uh, to do so. Uh, and you uh, you well, I think uh, the numbers are well over 100 billion have been committed already. And if you look ahead, it'll be something like a quarter of a trillion by uh, the middle part of the next uh, decade. That's a very significant uplift in defense expenditure and capability. Alongside that, it's not just about the absolute numbers, uh, important though those are. Uh, there is a commitment which 20% of that investment should go in equipment. We do, we, we meet that, not all other countries do. But also, as Jim Mattis, the former Secretary of Defense, set out, there is a need to ensure that that capability is real, that, it's, that it can be mobilized and mobilized effectively and quickly in response to a threat. And so the 30-30, hang on, 30-30-30-30 right. um, uh, program <coughs> that, uh, uh, that he set out is another important part of it within the overall um, uh, um, uh, uh, parameters that uh, of seeking to get all countries to meet the 2%. But we, you know, we, we, are we essentially take exactly the same position as the US. The 2% target was agreed at a NATO summit in Wales, um, which uh, we presided over uh, uh, several years ago. Uh, we were committed to it at the time and have achieved it. Uh, and we think all NATO allies uh, should, uh, should do so, as well as meeting these other commitments. So it's a, it's a story of success, uh, and I think the President should take some uh, 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 pride in that, but it's also a story of um, considerable progress still to be made. And can I ask, uh, the United Kingdom has been one of the key partners both in Afghanistan and in Syria, uh, and obviously a big debate here uh, over the nature of U.S. drawdown, U.S. withdrawal, drawdown in Afghanistan, is there a withdrawal from Syria? Um, how are London and Washington stitched up on the way forward on the operations in Afghanistan and Syria? Um, as closely as closely as ever. I mean, no one wants to have our troops uh, in any of these theatres in greater numbers or at greater risk uh, than is necessary, but to achieve the mission. And uh, uh, so we continue to work very closely together on, which, but the, the focus is to deliver the mission. To deliver the mission in Syria is about completing the uh, eradication of the territorial caliphate and continuing to suppress the threat that spills out of there from Daesh, uh, and of course, other terrorist groups, Al Qaeda has not completely gone away. They've, they've been less in the headlines, but they are still uh, there, and we don't want to see that threat move elsewhere. Uh, and that's going to, there's going to need to be a continuing campaign, not just a military campaign, but using all the security capabilities of the state. Uh, and we want to keep um, uh, those threats as far from our own borders as we possibly uh, can, and deal with them, uh, 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 and, and, and deal with the threats in Syria um, uh, on the ground. There's a continuing effort to do that. Uh, Afghanistan, 
Uh, well, I mean, I could talk to you for the rest of the afternoon about Afghanistan, uh, because obviously having served there uh, in two roles, I feel very passionately right. about it. I think actually if you look at where we are now, I mean, first is many people said predicted failure by this stage. That clearly hasn't happened. Uh, the Afghan government uh, continues um, uh, to uh, uh, sustain itself and indeed governs more and more uh, uh, effectively. Um, but of course, areas of the country are outside its control under, under the uh, a challenge by the Taliban. But there is now the opportunity with the, with the Khalilzad, uh, Zal Khalilzad's uh, effort to try and secure that political settlement, that reconciliation settlement, which uh, is, uh, 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 would underpin a durable political future for Afghanistan and in doing so enable us to draw down uh, most of our forces. There may still need to be, uh, I suspect there will for some time, a presence to conduct the counter-terrorist mission because there will still be areas uh, in which uh, uh, terrorist groups are, uh, are able uh, to operate and we don't want to do that obviously with the Afghans as in, as in other countries. Uh, but I think, we, uh, I think uh, uh, the, the trajectory towards accomplishing uh, the mission, uh, we, remain, we remain on. There will always be challenges, there will definitely be setbacks, but uh, uh, we remain completely committed to achieving the mission uh, that we set out on. I want to ask a uh, a broader question, but I want to be able to turn to the audience and take your questions in the, in the time remaining as well. So catch my attention in the conversation. I'll bring you into that. But first, um, let me, you talked a lot about the, the, the geopolitical trends and the shift of economic influence towards Asia. There's been a big issue of the discussion of China's role and presence in Europe as well. Uh, the European Union has started to grapple with how to actually think about Chinese investments. Uh, obviously, this has been a, a big issue for the United Kingdom itself. First of all, how do you how, how do you think about the presence of China now as a sig significant not just partner, trading partner with Europe, but an actor in Europe? How are you seeing that with your hat on uh, from Tim Downing? Um, well, I think you've described it well. I mean, China is China is a huge economic partner. We uh, uh, established a, a good relationship with China during the state visit of President Xi to the UK several. Uh, years ago, uh, but we also have some significant challenges, and we just recently, um, uh, because we had not secured uh, the action from China that we had hoped, we uh, uh, just attributed a uh, particular cyber cyber operation to uh, to China that we had hoped they were going to be able to resolve and hadn't, uh, and so we have a complex relationship, and, uh, and that's true of all countries, I think, that are dealing uh, with China. The huge potential of uh, uh, China's uh, economic integration into the world, uh, but inevitably the challenges of dealing with some of the uh, security issues that uh, emerge from there as well. And what is important is that we take a uh, consistent and uh, respectful, uh, but consistent uh, position where we're very clear about defending our own national interests. And the, the merger of your two big trends, the shift of economic power to Asia, China, and technology comes to a head in this issue of the race for 5G, artificial intelligence, and particularly the role of Huawei, which has been uh, much debated uh, in the transatlantic space. Uh, how is the British government grappling with uh, the presence and role of Huawei in the, in the British market? Well, actually, we've, we've had a, uh, an approach to this which is probably more mature than most other countries. We actually have a mechanism um, by which our National Cyber Security Center deals with um, uh, the presence of Huawei in the, uh, in the British market, uh, and that's been in place for several years. There's an annual report on uh, uh, how, that is, uh, how that is working, whether we're confident in the transparency, the standards, uh, 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 et cetera. Uh, and we're also looking overall um, at an approach to uh, investment in 5G um, and indeed in future technology, which is not just about Huawei. I mean, in the end, I think we've got to be careful not to, you know, not to just focus on individual countries or, uh, countries or companies, but actually what are the standards uh, that we expect to see, technical standards, security standards, uh, conduct mm -hmm. that we expect to see of any investment from, uh, from wherever it might come. In many ways, the, you know, the most significant threat, as I mentioned in my remarks, is of uh, criminal groups exploiting vulnerabilities rather than uh, state activity. And we have, to, you know, we have to be aware of all of the threats that we face. Uh, and so we think we have a pretty mature approach uh, to this that so far, uh, through regulation, through transparency, through setting very clear standards, that so far uh, we think is protecting our interests, uh, but also securing our economic benefit. Terrific. Thank you, Sir Mark. Let me take a couple of questions. So if I'm going to ask Mike to come to the front row, and I'll take uh, these two right here to start off, and then we'll pick up a few more. <laughs> front row, please. Sir, front row. Harlan and, and this woman right here, please. Thank you. 
please introduce yourself and a, qu and a brief question. Uh, hi, Mark. My name's Fatima. I actually used to work for you um, in cabinet office. I'm on sabbatical. Um, please ask me a really <laughs> easy question. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> that was not planted. I did so not know that. <laughs> so I will return to work soon, I promise. Uh, first and foremost, happy International Women's Day. Uh, Thank you. I well, on to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you spoke a lot about um, sort of hostile foreign activity and particularly Russian aggression towards Western allies. Um, and I wonder if you could comment on how, you know, cyber is a vector through which hostile foreign activity is being conducted against Western institutions, whether in the US and or in the UK. And what is the role of the UK? What is the partnership between the UK and the US in checking uh, malign state aggression towards our institutions, and what does that look like in practice? So Mark, let me pick up just a second one, just for interest yeah, of time, course, if yeah. you can, Harlan, please. Uh, so Mark, Harlan, Elman, good to see you again. Yeah. Thank you for a great uh, overview. Uh, my question really pertains to NATO and the 2%. Mm. I always found 2% a very, very shallow number for a number of reasons, largely because it's being spent on kinetic type forces. And I would argue you recognize General Gerasimov and his new doctorate, and your CDS does, that uh, the Russians are practicing what I would call electromagnetic blitzkrieg. And they believe that electronic war is four as to kinetic war is one. And it seems to me that we are developing the wrong types of forces to deal with where the Russians are strong. <laughs> On top of that, with the end of INF and the fact that New START is under jeopardy, the Russians are going to increase their nuclear advantage hugely. The assumption that that will block us, that will give them a lot of rain to work below the line of conflict. And I don't see NATO taking action. I don't see that we've done much about active measures. I really don't see that much going on here with the Mattis strategy of defeating and deterring. So what do we do about taking on what I believe to be the real nature of the Russian problem, namely this emphasis on information warfare, where they are also a way ahead of us. What would you propose? Even though I know we're stuck with 2%, how do you take the things that Nick Carter and a lot of your other people are doing and get the Americans and NATO to spend more time and energy on that? Great. Thank you. Well, the two questions are related. Um, uh, I mean, you, 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 are, you were asking about what do we see in the nature of cyber attacks, and essentially the two questions relate. Um, one of the things that is most challenging is that uh, uh, is, is is genuine attribution of cyber activity. Uh, something we've seen from Russia, but others too, is essentially criminal groups or private groups uh, operating in effect on behalf of the state. And of course, sometimes it can be the other way around. Uh, in societies which have high levels of corruption, uh, criminal groups can sometimes instrumentalize the uh, capabilities of the state in uh, their support. And it's often therefore very challenging to be really clear about exactly what the nature of a particular uh, attack might be. Is it designed to extort? Is it designed to uh, disrupt? Um, uh, uh, is it simply a warning? Is it simply a warning, uh, a warning shot? And that's part of the deliberate confusion. And it, it's, it, it goes to the first point, but it also goes hard on to your point. That it's part of the deliberate confusion that uh, is sought to be, uh, that they are seeking to, to sow. There's a phrase which is associated with uh, President Nixon about plausible deniability. Well, we're in the era now of implausible deniability but people still deny it and still seek, therefore, to confuse um, uh, uh, in, uh, securing, uh, 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 in securing, say, an international consensus to deal with a, deal with a particular issue. Uh, and therefore, we have to, what we have to do is not respond to a cyber attack with a cyber attack. But again, if you read your Sun Tzu, you identify the areas they're vulnerable and you're strong and choose those rather than necessarily simply <coughs> choosing to uh, contend or contest every single line of operation um, that, uh, that they might choose. So our response to Salisbury wasn't just the diplomatic expulsions and the disruption of the GRU, mm -hmm. important though that was. There were several other things we did as well, some of which we haven't publicized. Uh, but they, they didn't involve, obviously, a, an attack of a similar kind um, uh, uh, on, uh, on, the Russian, uh, on the Russian mainland. On your point about resources, I think it's a really important one. When I look at the, the UK's national security resources, I don't actually think particularly about the 2%. That's a commitment we've made. But we spend, broadly speaking, twice that overall if you look at na the national security capability uh, as a whole. Defence is the biggest part of it, of course, classic defence. Uh, but that does cover many of these other capabilities as well. And we should also see, as well as hard power and smart power, offensive cyber, some of these new uh, capabilities that we're all developing. But part of our armory is also the 
uh, the soft power uh, and the broader set of capabilities that we can uh, we can bring uh, we can bring to bear. Uh, one of the great benefits we have is allies, and uh, that the coherence we're able to bring to some of the challenges we face is something that most of our adversaries uh, uh, can't face. The UK is, was the first country, I think one or two more have now done so, to uh, um, uh, to, to uh, agree to put our, offen our national offensive cyber capability under NATO command should it be required. And that's mm. essentially in the same way that we would with nuclear or with uh, special forces. And we would encourage others, as they develop their own offensive cyber capabilities, to do the same, so that it can be deployed by NATO uh, should they need to do so. I, I don't think we should, we shouldn't assume that the Russians can secure a um, a, 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 a competitive advantage in some of the nuclear capabilities they're developing. They're very good at um, propagandizing those, uh, but let's not forget that you know, the Russian economy is, is smaller than the British economy. They may have a larger uh, a proportion of their economy devoted to defense and security, but in the end they can't sustain the kind of defense investment, let alone uh, innovation that the US defense uh, establishment can. The US defense budget is still bigger than the next 10, 12, whatever, combined. Um, and so they, what they have been able to do is identify a handful of um, high-end technologies that they have pursued and where they are genuinely world-class. But there are other areas where they're a long, long way behind us and their, their capabilities are not, uh, are not balanced. So we, again, need to retain some confidence in our own collective capability. That doesn't mean NATO doesn't have to modernize and raise its game. Absolutely it does. Uh, but I still think we, we, we start from a, a, a strong position. And pick up a couple more questions for this woman here, please. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Sylwia Szablowska from the, I'm the Polish Assistant Defense Attaché here. Hi. I'm really happy <laughs> yeah, to hear you. So, uh, personally, obviously, I share the feelings of most of the European Union population. So, to put it shortly, we are not happy that you're leaving. But uh, well, the say, we're not leaving Europe. <laughs> we're not going anywhere. The European we're just, Union. We're just, you know, changing yeah. our institutional relationships. Uh, so, so <laughs> if you could um, say some few w words more about uh, the defense realm. So, uh, in case of no deal Brexit, you know, no deal Brexit may be quite disruptive in short term, especially. So, what are your scenarios for defense cooperation? That's the first question. And the second, what about the Northern Ireland and uh, the Irish border? What scenarios do you? Why don't you, you pass the there? mic just right in front of you, if you might, please? And we'll take a couple. Sorry. Hello, my name is Sanjin Cho Langham Partners. I was former resident of Square Mars. So my question to you with regard to the meeting with Red Kudlow, and uh, I assume so one of the key issues uh, post-Brexit US and UK trade issues. So my sense is that USTR take quite assertive and aggressive approach to UK with regard to agriculture, non-tariff barriers, and uh, currency. So A, do you feel Larry Kudlow is the same wavelength with um, Ambassador Lighthizer and B, with regard to the uh, article, should the UK government request article extension of Article 50? What is impact when European Parliament election is scheduled to be held May 23rd to 25th, which UK will be still a member of EU? I would be interested in your views. Thank you. Uh, four questions, so we'll let you take uh, those, Exactly. Uh, well, thank you. Well, let me just let me tackle the Brexit ones, uh, uh, the Brexit ones together. I mean, obviously, the European parliamentary elections, which are due to take place in May, are a factor in any uh, extension that uh, we might seek. But let's be clear: at the moment, we're still seeking to secure a deal, to secure it over the next few days, get it voted through in Parliament, um, get it ratified, and leave uh, leave uh, uh, the EU on schedule. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll come to questions about how, you know, what those contingencies might be, should that, should that not uh, prove, uh, prove to be uh, the case. In terms of your question about no deal, of course, and I've, I've been on the record in uh, our own parliament about setting out some of the inevitable disruption uh, that a, sh a, a severance of those relationships in a, uh, uh, um, um, you know, essentially uh, quickly uh, would cause. It's largely economic. Whether or not there is a short or long-term disruption to our security arrangements actually largely depends on our European partners. We remain completely committed to our security and defence relationship, but whether, for example, we can continue to exchange uh, data uh, in the way we would need to uh, in law enforcement or national security and so on actually very much depends uh, on the other side. We would obviously aim to do so, but in a sense it's a question for you uh, and people on the other side, uh, on the, other side of the, uh, the table. The, but the general point I would make is that the, the, um, 
security and defense interests of the continent of Western Europe are common to us all, whatever our institutional relationships. You know, some of our closest partners are non-NATO partners, but we still operate very closely with them in, uh, in this area. And we will be one of those countries that's a member of NATO, not a member of the EU. There are many others, Norway, for example, uh, who have the closest possible security and defense relationship and remain completely committed uh, through the alliance, the North Atlantic Alliance, to the security and defense of the continent. And that's what the UK will do too. Terrific. So, Mark, I know you, you are on a tight clock. To I, off I to have Secretary to go and see Pompeo, the Secretary. So I'm, yes. Unfortunately, I know there are a lot more questions, but I'm going to have to wrap that up. I do want to just, I want to thank you for coming to the Atlanta Council. I wish you, all, Her Majesty's government, the best of luck next thank week you. and a tumultuous week. And just to underscore the point that the team here at the Atlanta Council is working on this idea, looking forward, how do we keep the U.S.-U.K. relationship as a force for good? And we look forward to being partners with you and your, and your amazing team here in Washington. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. That. Please join me in thanking Sir Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.